Good evening and welcome here tonight to the second in our series with Q. We've been teaming up with them to bring you some fantastic talks and tonight's promises to be one of the best. Q, as everybody knows, is absolutely at the forefront of addressing our crucial problems with biodiversity and as an institution, they have done simply amazing work, some of which we'll hear about tonight. So last time we were with Q, we talked about food and the future of food and the hope that it's going to get better. Um, we looked at everything from the benefits of beans to exciting alternatives for potatoes. And for anyone who missed it, it was a terrific conversation and it is available online. But tonight we're going to be turning our focuses towards trees and forests and why they really are the life of this planet. Trees, as you know, as we all know, are in many, many things. They're sources of wonder, they're symbols of ancient rites and religions, but they are also an absolutely crucial part of our ecosystem. I mean, they are literally the lungs of our earth, as the Amazon rainforest has been described, but much closer to home. The trees that you have around you are responsible not only for giving you your oxygen every day, but also for sequestering staggering amounts of carbon beneath their roots and into the soil below them. Now, we've got some amazing speakers lined up for you tonight. Um, it's the usual format. The speakers will all make introductory remarks. We'll then talk among ourselves. And then please come in and ask questions. And I promise I'll try and get to as many as we can. But just before we kick off, I'd just like to make a very special point of inviting you all to come in person to Q on the 21st of June, Midsummer's Night. And we're having a fantastic event with Q's Directors of Science, the author and scientist Alexandra Antonelli. And he'll be joined by Jackie Morris, who's the illustrator and author of The Lost Words, as well as the writer and journalist Guy Shrubsole, who has written about the lost rainforest of Britain. So we have got some tickets left, not a lot, but please come and we would love to see you because we've missed you all and there'll be drinks as well. So with fur no further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker tonight and I'm completely in awe of this speaker. Uh, she's joining us from Oregon. She normally lives a little bit further north up the American West Coast. She is Suzanne Simard, Professor Suzanne Simard. She is the Professor of Forest Ecology at the University of British Columbia. But you will know her and I know her as the woman who wrote Finding the Mother Tree. It also made her the inspiration, the heroine in Richard Power's awesome book, The Overstory. But Suzanne's book, if you haven't read it, then please buy it, please get it. We're gonna put details in the chat. It is a light bulb book. You read it and you think, I'll never think about the world quite the same again. It's an extraordinary book. She was recently presented with the Q Medal for this year, and I was very lucky enough to go along and give her to a lecture that she heard. So I couldn't be happier to be handing over to her. And Suzanne, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, for for coming to this uh, webinar today. I'm so delighted to speak with you. Um, so I, I grew up in uh, what we call old growth forests in, in Western Canada. Um, they're also, you might think of them as primary forests or forests that have never been logged um, by humans, but of course shaped by humans through uh, ancestral knowledge systems uh, that date back thousands of years. Um, and Growing up in these forests, I got to know them as a, as a kid as very connected uh, places where um, out of that emerges this incredible beauty that Rosie talked about so eloquently. Um, and all the, the life support systems that we depend on on this earth are interwoven with forests. So, um, you know, forests only cover about one third of the world's or the, the earth's surface, uh, and yet they are home to 80% of species. Um, they're, they're the source of 80% of our clean water. Um, they, they actually store, and scientists don't know exactly how much, but between 50 and 80% of terrestrial carbon pools. So they're really, really important to the stability of our climatic systems. Um, when I was growing up, I, I, I came from a horse logging family, actually. My grandfather was a horse, horse logger, and it turns out that 
you know, if I go back hundreds of years through my lineage, I, I learned that actually that my family, the Simar family, uh, were loggers even as far back as in when they lived in when, when, when before we emigrated from France. Um, so they were sawyers in France and then became sawyers right across uh, through the St. Lawrence Seaway and then emigrated across Canada and continued to be horse loggers. And what does that mean? It means that they were uh, selective loggers. They just took out individual trees from the forest to feed their families, really a peasant family. And and really this kind of logging is 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 actually you know, a very sensitive way of, of working with the ecosystem. Um, when you look at indigenous uh, forest practices, they really much focused on on the trees, you know, taking out trees that they needed for for their clothing and for uh, houses and so on. And, and so they logged trees, but they didn't log forests. And that means, uh, you know, that the, the forest was left intact and regenerative with all the, the big old trees left behind to seed into the forest, provide legacies and soil for the next generations and really nourishing those next generations of forests. Um, with industrialization uh, in the last century, that's changed completely um, to where across the world, whether you're in a boreal forest, a temperate forest like you are in Britain, or, uh, or in a tropical forest like the Amazon or the Congo, um, clear cut logging has really taken over because of driven by our, our economic system, which is about, you know, taking as much as you can um, and, and making money from it. And this has been really destructive for our forests around the world. Um, and at home, I saw this happening too. I, I you know, growing up in, in old growth forests, I, now I live among clear cuts and, and it's heartbreaking. And I think there's like global grief over this kind of activity and not just global grief with humans, but it's changing our climate. Um, and so I started studying how trees really form a community, a society, and how that those societies or communities or forests, as we call them, um, are really dependent on the relationships with other trees and other animals. These intact systems need to be intact to, to express these relationships. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, trees will have all kinds of sophisticated ways of relating to one another. They live beside each other for hundreds, if not thousands of years in many cases. Um, and they compete, they collaborate, they cooperate, they facilitate each other. Sometimes th there can be parasitisms. There's all kinds of ways that they have a conversation uh, in community with each other. Um, and when we clear cut these forests, we kind of sever those linkages, those relationships, and, and then they have to reestablish themselves. So this has actually had you know, quite a, a, a large impact on forests around the world in that it's really hard to uh, develop new relationships with, you know, with all uh, same age trees that are grown up in plantations um, without elders around, without you know, good soil, um, that they have to reest it's like teenagers raising themselves without parents. Um, at least that's the way I see it. And today, you know, we, we've actually, uh, already harvested about 97% of in the temperate forests, uh, these native forests, these old forests, they've been converted to plantations. And so I think that, you know, in my closing comment here is that we need to do some things here to, um, to really help forests, um, help us to, you know, to, to stabilize our climate, to stem the, the loss of biodiversity and restore our, you know, our cycles, the water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and so on. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing is to really protect our remaining old growth forests. Um, the 3% that we have left that are the big old growth forests, they need to be set aside and protected. Um, so, and secondly, to restore the forests that have been converted to plantations so that they're thriving once again. And we can do that. Um, in still getting some wood out of these second growth forests, but really restoring their vitality and biodiversity. Um, so there's clear paths ahead of us, I think, from a scientific point of view. It's really up to us to implement some of these solutions. And when we do, I really believe that we can, um, you know, help revitalize our forests so that they're, again, uh, uh, part of the climate stability and a solution to climate change. So thanks so much. Suzanne, thank you. That was wonderful and wonderful to have you here. And um, yes, there is just so much that we need to know and appreciate and understand. Um, I find it extremely vivid, your part in your book, when you first encountered the idea of clear cutting and that 
we always think that people will thrive if they're just everything else is taken away. And in fact, of course, people don't thrive without communities and trees don't thrive either. So thank you. Um, our next speaker tonight is Ed Eichin, and he is the director of Q Wakehurst. Now, Wakehurst is the if you haven't if you've only been to Q, you need to go to Wakehurst as well. And it is the 535 acre botanic site in Sussex, which is really the science center of Q. And Ed has launched the Nature Unlock program. He's pioneered lots of major projects on the site, including the American Prairie. And he has made Wakehurst a living laboratory so that we can scientifically start to measure some of nature's benefits. So Ed, thank you very much for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Rosie, for that rousing introduction. OK, I'm going to share my screen. This is always a, a nerve wracking moment. Um, and I'm just going to whiz back. So um, I'm going to be sort of flying the flag for botanic gardens this evening. And, uh, you know, my, my grandiose title is, you know, what can our botanic gardens do for our future treescapes or kind of what can Q do perhaps to be more specific? And I think if we're not careful, we can kind of picture botanic gardens as these kind of frozen moments in time, almost these kind of carefully curated period pieces. But I think in reality, they're really interesting and dynamic systems. They're absolutely packed with diversity, not just um, floral diversity, but um, you know, sort of uh, all kind of kingdoms are sort of intriguingly represented. And they're full of novelty as well. They're full of different species, which are not necessarily part of our UK flora. Um, so I think, you know, we need to turn our scientific attentions onto our botanic gardens themselves and kind of see what interesting solutions they can offer us. Um, but, you know, what? why do we need our botanic gardens? And I'm going to warn you, the next couple of images aren't terribly uplifting. Um, so the first is uh, an ash tree. So ash dieback, of all the diseases which threaten our kind of UK free, tree flora, ash dieback is the one that is the most visceral, the most rapid in its action the most distressing you know um, Suzanne talked about about grief and I you know we create these uh, so-called monumental structures which basically makes the tree safe and I almost see these as as monuments to to lost friends now ash dieback um, is going to take out roughly 60 to 70 percent of our ash woodlands um, and it's really a, a, a case of sort of mistaken importation we brought this disease in it comes from Asia where the ash trees have evolved to live with it our ash trees sadly cannot. So this tree is critical for how woodlands work. It drives succession when the trees are mature then a huge load of species depend on them. The second is our beech tree. So I struggle to find healthy beech trees in southeast England now and for me this is the living embodiment of climate change, not that sort of destructive apocalyptic climate change we read about but the slow grinding removal of fitness, you know, taking our trees to the point where they're no longer thriving within their environment. And beech trees, our beech trees hate very hot summers and they hate very wet winters. So, you know, those kind of key indicators of climate change are, are kind of undermining our beech trees significantly. And that allows diseases like Trichmeria, which makes the tree very brittle or kind of beech bark disease, which we can see here, uh, kind of jump into a tree whose immune system is, is shattered effectively. So the first question is, well, what can we do? And the, the challenge number one is kind of what can we do within that species? So, you know, species are diverse within themselves and primarily it's genetic diversity, what we might call biogeographic diversity. So, you know, different populations uh, across a range of a tree have different characteristics. Uh, and within Q, we've got um, the National Tree Seeds Project at Waker. So this is a very diverse bank of tree seeds. A lot of genetic diversity is in there. And our horticulturists are really, really good at bringing these seeds to life. So the first question is, how can we kind of mine this genetic bank to work out what kind of options we have within that species? And then we need to trial. So we need to understand really against a whole set of scenarios where our tree species are going. Um, so, you know, trees that might be fit now could be unfit within, say, 10 or 15 years because of climate change. So there's a whole kind of pathway that we need to go through from working out germination to looking at sort of um, planting, but not just planting establishment. You know, we talk so much about planting a tree and that's really just the beginning. We shouldn't even really talk about our, our, our kind of new trees until they're fully established in my 
mind and they're kind of starting to display what we might call ecosystem function you know they're starting to work within their environment but trialing trees within controlled environments we can sort of turn the temperature up for a few degrees or turn the stress up a few degrees and ultimately see what's going to happen we've got really good so-called models as well these kind of uh, mathematical computational systems that start to work out where a species might be going so you know we need to mine we need to trial but the question might be well what if certain species are no longer fit um, so, you know, ash tree is the obvious one. Are we going to find a substitution for ash within our kind of ash species? And this raises some really interesting questions, because I think from a purely objective evidence based view, we should be quite interested in the novelty our botanic gardens have. We have species from other parts of the world that are genuinely fit and thriving in our changing climate. And I would pick out well, these are our north of Fager. So this is the southern beach from places like Chile. Um, and New Zealand, but also things like the tulip tree are thriving in these UK climates. So the question is, if, if we can no longer find uh, UK species to fill niches, do we start to consider other species if we sign up to the principle that we will need a treescape? You know, we need Britain to be wooded uh, in the future and kind of, you know, provide that, that treescape. Now, from an objective evidence point of view, you can just think, well, OK, this species has this ecosystem function. It has these ecosystem services, you know, the um, the ability to, say, absorb pollution or cast shade or stop flooding. Um, and we could be fine with that as a scientific community. But inevitably, it's not just about evidence. It's about values. And we may perceive certain species to have foreignness uh, that they might kind of you know be perceived to have uh, alien or exotic qualities um, and that might challenge our, our nativeness um, and I think I'm just I'm just flagging this up because we can very rarely have a purely objective and scientific conversation and this for me indicates that trees aren't just ecological entities they're cultural entities too and our and our lives and our perceptions are deeply entwined with them and what they symbolize so that's my kind of my opening uh, sort of foray and um, hopefully that will kind of stimulate some conversation that is so interesting yes I, I mean when you said that thing about the diseases coming in and our native trees not being able to cope with it for some reason I mean what came into my mind was thinking about places like South America where Spanish arrived and they had chickenpox and it just wiped everyone out because they weren't able to cope with it and so it is a very it's a very colonialist thing that has been done, but gosh, yeah. you raised so many questions, which I know we will come back to. So I'm now very pleased to introduce Joe Crowley to you all. Joe is a filmmaker as well as an environmentalist, and he's an undercover journalist as well. And he's made a, a number of fantastic films on environmental subject. One was about the great river pollution scandal, sadly not yet solved, but thanks to Joe, at least something that everyone talks about. And in this context, he recently made a film about Drax, happens to be one of my bet noirs, a big, big, gigantic factory up in Yorkshire that burns trees. And he made a very hard hitting program about why on earth, as a government and as a country, we continue to subsidize biomass, calling it a form of sustainable energy. Joe, over to you and thanks. Great, thank you very much, Rosie. Let me um, try and share my screen quickly. So hopefully this works. Good, there we are. So that is Drax Power Station that Rosie was just uh, mentioning there. It's um, absolutely huge. It is the UK, well, it, it provides 5% of the UK's electricity. It's not just the UK's biggest wood burning power station. It is the world's biggest wood burning power station. Uh, the amount of wood it gets through is staggering. And I'm just gonna quickly play you a little clip from our uh, investigation last, uh, October, and uh, this will give you a sense of the scale of it all, I think. The amount of wood pellets Drax burns is astonishing. You get a sense of the amount of wood needed when you see one of these trains. It's got 25 wagons and can carry up to 1,800 tonnes of wood pellets. And all of that will only keep the power station going for about two hours. 
Yeah, which is pretty staggering. So um, let me just make sure we move on. So in total, uh, last year, I think Drax burnt 6.6, yeah, there you are, million tonnes of wood pellets. If you want to think of that in trees, you sort of need to double it because of the water and, and the fact that it's sort of, um, these are compressed and dried wood pellets. So you're thinking about sort of 13 million tonnes of trees. It's an incredible amount of wood. And where does it all come from? Well, it doesn't come from the UK. That's the main point. Most of it's from uh, America, from Canada, from Baltic states like Latvia, Estonia. Uh, increasing amounts are coming in from Brazil, which should probably raise a few eyebrows. So uh, none of it is coming from the UK. We just don't have that kind of uh, quantity of woodland in quite a denuded country that we have now. So why do we do this? Well, this is a, uh, a graphic from Drax's own uh, report. This is the carbon cycle as they see it. So you take a sustainably managed forest, We'll let them have that one for now. Uh, it's logged and uh, sawmill residues and also forestry residues from the logging go into a pellet plant. This is made into biomass, which is burnt in places like Drax. That releases the carbon into the atmosphere. And then the idea is that the next generation, the trees are replanted and, and growing forests absorb that CO2. And sometimes that theory works quite well. If we take a maize you know, field, if you were to grow maize, cut it all down after one year, burn it, that would release all the carbon. If you grow the same maize in the same field the next year, in theory, that has absorbed the same amount of carbon from the atmosphere as the previous crop that you burnt. So that all works out, but there's a big problem. You can't run Drax on maize. Uh, it just, there isn't the energy there. It would probably, you need an all of maize just to keep Drax running for, for a few hours, let alone weeks or months or years. But also it's about payback time. Clearly an example of a maize field, it's a one year payback time. It isn't as simple when it comes to forests and when it comes to trees. Um, we could be looking at, especially when it's primary forest, forest that hasn't been cut before, uh, the payback time could range from decades to hundreds of years. And in that time, there will be more CO2 in the atmosphere. We're emitting it up front and gradually taking it back. So we can't afford, and there's sort of quite clear scientific consensus on this now, we cannot afford to do that because we need to be solving climate change in the coming decades, not waiting for decades and decades and keeping adding more carbon um, into the atmosphere. So, uh, this is primary forest I visited in British Columbia. It's actually rainforest. It's absolutely beautiful. And uh, I'm afraid this is the sort of place that Drax is getting quite a lot of its wood pellets from. You can see here in British Columbia, they've got eight pellet plants. They've got another two in Alberta. Drax, I think, produces or has the capacity to produce about 80% of British Columbia's uh, wood pellets. Now, when we looked at this for Panorama, we tracked where a lot of their feedstock was coming from. And we also found two sites where Drax actually had the logging licenses. So the headline of our investigation was Drax cuts down primary forest for pellets. And that's true. This is its um, meadow bank pellet yard, a bit blurry, sorry about that, but you can sort of get a sense of it. And that's not full actually, that's at sort of one of its more empty moments in the year. Um, but these are the sort of trees that are turning up there. Anyway, this, in terms of the two logging licenses Drax had, this was one site we went to where they had already logged. Um, and you can see it's a sort of a scene of devastation. It's clear cutting, the sort of clear cutting that Suzanne was talking about. And this was the other site that they hadn't cut when we went out there. It is uh, not just primary forest, but it has lots of old growth, which is, I suppose, the UK equivalent. We talk about ancient forest. Um, it's got lots of old growth growing through it. So it's, it's crazy that that's going to be cut. Drax have actually started cutting a bit of it, but then they stopped when our program went out. I don't know if they're ever going to go back there. Um, but actually, to some extent, the point I want to make here is that Drax normally doesn't have the logging licenses and following our program says it won't apply for any more logging licenses. And yet the problem will continue. That isn't the end of it because holding the logging license is not really how Drax typically operates. What they do is they take other um, cut blocks and they take wood from them once they've been harvested for timber. And if we look at Drax's uh, report here, this is the key term here, low grade roundwood. Now Drax will take sawdust from sawmills, 
It will take, as it says here, branches and tops. That's the bits that can't be used by the sawmills. It will take thinnings from plantations. That's not really the case in British Columbia. Um, in British Columbia, we're talking about primary forest because the interior of British Columbia hasn't really been industrially logged long enough for there to be secondary plantations now that are ready to be harvested. It's only been going on for about 50 years. So low grade hardwood is the key here. And the point is, if you take, this is an example for us, this is not one where Drax are going to cut, but if you take these slides here, look at what there is there. There are a few mother trees, as Suzanne would say, big, you know, trees that are straight and old and the timber industry would want them. But everything else is fair game for pellets. The stuff that's too small, the stuff that isn't straight, or the species that the timber industry doesn't want. Look at this. This is actually where Drax, I think, um, have one of their logging licenses. Look at all the deciduous trees there amongst the conifers. Now, no industry takes deciduous trees in British Columbia. The timber industry doesn't want them. This is cottonwoods and um, aspen. Um, and the paper, the pulp industry doesn't want them. So all these kind of healthy whole trees, all the smaller ones, are fair game for pellets. So this is what Drax means when it says low grade roundwood. It will say, well, really, we just take diseased and rotten woods, you know, but actually that isn't the case. Here's a truck turning up, at, weighing in at one of its pellet yards. And this is typically what their, their log yards look like. So um, I think that's the point I kind of want to make here that, you know, it's, it's not only a renewable resource. These are, as Suzanne said, you have to separate tree from forest. When you are clear cutting, the idea is that, you know, these trees will regrow and they will capture carbon, but it's not all about carbon. It's about forests. Trees can be planted again, but primary forests are by their definition, non-renewable. And unfortunately that's pretty much all that is being cut in British Columbia. And that's where the majority of Drax's pellets come from. So um, from this and, and these kind of trees, they're all ending up in Yorkshire to be burned for electricity to power our computers and dare I say our Zoom call this evening. Joe, thank you very much. Um, it's also true that that horrible Drax plant gives out the most enormous amount of carbon. So quite where they managed to tick sustainability and climate change boxes I don't understand. Um, please get your questions um, going because um, after our next speaker uh, we'll be coming into the audience and talking. Our next speaker is Cassie Willis who's the Professor of Biodiversity at the University of Oxford. She's the Principal of St Edmund Hall and she used to be the Scientific Director of Kew. She's also a crossbench peer and an absolute um, genius on all the things that you want to know about how does mental health get affected by trees? How much time do you need to spend with trees? What is this thing that we talk about, about it's healthy to go out into the environment? Who knows? I mean, Cathy knows is the answer. So Cathy, over to you and thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, Rosie. And I'll try and share my screen at this point. Um, one second, let's see if, we, can you see that? Right, I hope you can see this tree, this uh, tree, this, <laughs> this screen. So, Following on actually from that superb talk before by Joe, I just really want to take it to uh, give another reason why we really, really need to think properly about what we're doing when we cut down trees. But I'm really focusing on trees in cities. And I want to focus just with a few slides on why we really do need to think about um, conserving and enhancing nature and our green spaces in cities and beyond actually in forests. Now, we've known for a long time that trees can be really important in cities as an indirect benefit. What I mean by that is that um, they remove the pollution and therefore they reduce the, the issues that we have from um, irritated uh, respiratory systems. They're also important for heat reduction, for flood, flood, flood control and various other things. That's well known. What's not so well known, I think, is that they also have direct benefits. And there are thousands of studies coming through that showing areas that have more trees, even if you take into account all the socioeconomic factors that are out there, still show people having better health outcomes. And I really like this study. This study is from Toronto. And in Toronto, they've got this fantastic uh, public health database of 31,000 people, but they also know every single street tree in Toronto. 
And what they found, as you can see on the slide, is that people, doesn't matter what their background or what their socioeconomic status is, people who live in areas that have, or streets that have more trees, have less cardiovascular um, conditions, less metabolic conditions, and they have significantly higher mental and physical well-being attributes. But another thing we often don't think about or don't know enough about is this one. There's there's a, a really beautiful study done in the States and going back to Ed's point about uh, health of trees. This study looked at the emerald ash borer, which is this rather beautiful beetle here, but it's not beautiful when it gets into trees. It, it basically it eats its way through into the bark. You can see those little um, roots. It's eaten into the bark and into the trunk of the tree. And the tree dies after about two years. And this study looked at the infestation of street trees in the United States, going or northern part of the United States, and going from east to west. So red is the earliest time, then you see blue, and then you see green in there. And what they found was that as the trees died, so this is a before and after shot of the different um, uh, the ash trees once they've died in an area, after they died, you got increased numbers of human deaths aligned with the areas that had increased deaths of trees. And these were related to all sorts of different symptoms. But there's, as you can see on the right hand side of the slide, I can't see because I've got my face in it, but let me see if I can get that down. As you can see from here, that you, they estimated that there was about a, an additional 15,000 cardiovascular rated later deaths related to those those just the loss of those trees the two were associated very closely statistically but what this doesn't say is why and this is the point that really we now need to get on to because understanding or just seeing an association between the trees and the deaths doesn't actually tell you what's driving this. And there are four hypotheses now out there about what's going on. One is that actually we thrive better when we have a higher level of biodiversity. And particularly think about that in trees, you think of those forests we've just seen. The second is it's something to do with the color and that we have a reaction to green in a very different way. And it brings out very different positive physical and mental well-being aspects in us. The third is that it's to do with the shape of how we see trees. So I've, I've got on here, you've got these tall, thin trees, and then you've got an oak on a landscape. If you measure brain activity, when people look at those two different photos, they're much more relaxed when they look at the oak in terms of brain activity than they are when they look at those tall, straight cypress trees. But the last one, I think possibly one of the most important and the one I'm going to just very briefly discuss is about the green scent or the volatile organic compounds that plants release. So if you walk in a pine forest, you get that very piney smell. That's these these volatile organic compounds are being released by the pine, pine trees. Now, all of this is a really newly emerging research field, but as you can see from the list there, it covers all aspects of science because it's so important to understand why and how these things link through to our health. So I'm just going to give you one example related to smell. So I think what most people don't think when you go into a pine forest or one of those forests we've just seen lovely photos of, when you breathe in, it doesn't just you don't just breathe the scent out again, it actually passes across your lung membrane into your blood. So if we look at this diagram here, this was a paper published a couple of years ago, the top graph there, I think I've got this in here. Yeah, the top graph shows the concentration of different volatile organic compounds in the ambient air, so in the air in this conifer forest. The bot, the next one down shows the concentration of those compounds in the blood of the participants before they walked in the forest. The third one down shows what happens after you walk in the forest. Your blood takes on the signature of those volatile organic compounds. And particularly the one I've picked out there, number two is pinene. And alpha pinene is known to trigger a whole host of biochemical processes in our bodies that improve our health. So I'm just gonna give you one example. So this is the Japanese uh, Hinoki, the Japanese Hinoki Cypress. And in this lovely experiment, what they did was they had 12 healthy males sleeping in a room for three, a hotel room for three nights, and they diffused this Hinoki oil in the air in the, a straightforward diffuser. 
And they analyze their urine every day and their blood samples at the beginning and the end of the experiment. So what did they find? So we just have a look at this one here and I'll just get this to the arrows in here and those ones there, right? So the, to the far right-hand side, that what you see there is a statistically significant difference in the amount of adrenaline. So that hormone adrenaline that gets elevated when you're stressed, a big drop in adrenaline. Now you could say, well, they were in a hotel room three nights, it was calm. But it, that wasn't shown in the control in the people who slept in a, in a room without this being diffused. But the most important thing to see in here is this other graph, the one in the middle. Because what that shows, and it's been shown a lot and a lot more recently as well and, and be published in some really high impact uh, toxicology journals, they get a big increase or there was an elevated increase in natural killer cells in the blood. Now, natural killer cells are something we all need to have in our blood because they play a major role in tackling viruses and cancers. So by just smelling that scent, they got this really big um, increase in natural killer cells. Further up and following on experiments have shown now when people walk in these forests, in these forests of Cyprus, a Cupressaceae forest in particular, that you get this enhanced natural killer cells in your blood and it lasts for up to seven days after you've walked in the forest. So by walking in that forest, you've enhanced your immune system to tackle all of these sorts of diseases that none of us want to get. So just a final few thoughts about plants and health. The first one, and I need to say this because I think people often think, well, you know, th these are sorts of diseases we don't need to worry about. Yes, we do. 71% of all deaths globally are from non-communicable diseases, including all these sorts of things where trees and plants can really make a difference. And I'm, this is not just one study, there are thousands of studies coming through, but they're not published in biology or ecology journals, they're being published in the Lancet, in toxicology, in these top medical journals. So the medical scientists are getting this, but I still think the biodiversity scientists are quite a long way off from this, this information. And so we really now do need to recognize this additional uh, direct, these, these direct health benefits that we get from plants and particularly from trees, which is another extremely good reason why we should not be cutting them down and we should not be burning them for fuel. So I'll stop sharing that point. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you, Cassie. That was so enlightening. Um, let's, let's turn everybody else's screens on now, if you can, and um, please, chat among yourselves as well as we'll start taking questions from the audience. But um, Suzanne, that last that presentation by Cathy there, um, I presume it doesn't surprise you, but I suppose I'm interested in, you know, because you, you work a lot with Native American tribes who've lived in forests. Are you, how do you think they understood all that benefit? Did they verbalize it or did they just accept it? I mean, the, the cultures are entwined and, uh, you know, part of nature. I mean, um, if you, you know, in, in ceremony, the trees, the forest is expressed throughout ceremony. Of, and these ceremonies, like, like the potlatch, um, is, you know, it, the, the trees, the forest, the animals that live in those forests, um, you know, are all, you know, shape governance, they shape hereditary systems, they shape how, you know, the, the cohesion of the community, mm -hmm. um, and working and living and, 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 and depending on forests for livelihoods for thousands of years, um, you know, it, it is their one with their forests. And, when colonialism happened in North America um, and, and through the Americas, I guess, but where I come from, yeah. and people were removed from their forests and they could no longer care for their forests, like their their um, obligations and that were really handed down through thousands of years of generations were, were torn apart. And so, and that when people were removed from their forests and, and, their, and their responsibilities for the forest taken away from them, and the forest literally taken away from them, now we see, you know, high suicide rates and high death rates and addiction rates. I mean, and it, it's, it's, we're in a, a stage of, I think, of renewal and recovery and recognizing the deep 
trauma of removing people from the force, but it's really borne out like in, you know, in history, it, it, it's undeniable. The things that Kathy just presented, you know, you could trace back through colonial history and say, yes, all that stuff happened. Mm -hmm. um, and that the health of those communities is being restored as they get land back and rights back. And, um, mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a process that we all have to continue to work on. And I think we can do this, um, but it's something we have to be very intentional um, and, and, you know, and work towards restoring health of communities that, that lived on these lands for a long, long time. And, and can we, um, I mean, this is both to Ed and to Cathy and to Suzanne, whoever wants to pick it up. I mean, given what Ed said about how we have new types of trees growing, I mean, and, and starting to thrive in other areas, how, how will that affect um, the way that people live among trees and work with trees? Will it, will it be, what do you think, Ed? Is it going to be straightforward or are you going to be missing something because the world is changing? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I mean, there's the, the old cliche about COVID and how everyone got back to nature and perhaps got to know their local woodland or local nature reserve better and whether some of the cultural qualities of those spaces imprinted on them. And as Cathy said, the shape of an oak is so distinctive and actually very hard to kind of replicate when you start to look to, to other floras. Um, but there are interesting questions about when you take a step back and kind of ask about the function of trees, the roles they can play, whether they can actually interact with other species and some exotic flora can do that. They can fit into systems. And just to say, you know, this is not new. I mean, you look across Britain, we have novelty everywhere. You know, we have American redwoods coming out of old oak woodland across our region, the high weald. Um, and I think we can adapt in time. Um, there's just always the interesting question about what role will these trees play? And that's, that's a, a way to frame it, I think. And just looking at some of our exotic collections, you know, some of our exotic trees are packed with nectar, you know, and they offer really interesting feeding windows for our invertebrates that some of our UK flora don't. So, so Cathy, do you, do you find that, that all trees make different contributions to the whole of the system, the, the planet? I, well, I think by researching all this, the the sort of aspects of health and how they how what 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 plants could provide in terms of health benefits, I've stopped thinking about species so much. So I'm very much in line with that. I I increasingly think about the functions of the trees. So if you look at the the, the last slide I gave, you know the mm -hmm. those pinene and limoline, those 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 uh, volcanic. Uh, those organic compounds, um, you know, there are many, many species that will provide that. And many of them may well be some of these exotics that Ed is talking about a shade or um, other mental well-being effects of, of, you know, things we can see. It, I, I think we have to be really careful that we don't try and create a system or a state where nothing can ever change. Yeah. And, that, you know, it's either pure or it's in, uh, sort of a non-native invasive. Because, mm. I mean, I'm a paleoecologist by training, so I've looked at fossil records for many, many years. And whenever we have a period of climatic instability, we get vast turnovers in communities of trees and totally weird and wonderful, you know, things mixed. Now, of course, we've we've helped this hugely by moving plants all over the world, but I think we have to embrace change. But mm -hmm. the, what we can't do is totally change the ecosystem from tree to no tree, which is exactly where we're coming back to this. You know, that's that's when it goes really, really wrong. And, and Joe, just before we bring in now the mounting audience questions, I mean, people have always burnt wood. I mean, now we know wood gives off a lot of carbon. I mean, is there any, um, any in any way, shape or form, a world, the kind of world we live in where you could use biomass or should we just be saying goodbye to it? Dan. I was being polite and had muted. I think it's a question of scale. I think on the mass scale that we're seeing in the UK, it is not feasible and it drives some very strange decisions. And I think it does drive forest degradation. But there is genuine waste, wood waste. You know, when you take um, logs and you turn them into square or rectangular you know forest products there's an awful lot of sawdust maybe you lose half the tree in sawdust you know and at the moment and in the past that has been burnt in British Columbia uh, you know that they were burnt in giant 
beehive burners and to no benefit at all other than you know the carbon goes back into the atmosphere but yeah of course it's much better if you can if it's going to be burned anyway to, to recover heat or some kind of power from it there, there is an argument for it there is an argument for it on small scale on using genuine residues and waste the problem when it's used on a mass scale as I sort of I know I rambled and quickly got through the slides but is that everything now is being categorized as waste even very healthy trees even the next generation of forests that's the problem we've got and and that's why i think probably subsidized biomass and in the last three years we've given drax we all have british bill payers taxpayers 2.3 billion pounds oh, billion yeah. just in the last three years i think it's the subsidy that drives the madness and it doesn't work on the scale I think that's a really good point. I mean, the money is so colossal and they'll be bidding so hard to get it. Um, there's a question here from Claire Obira. Thomas Packenham suggests that we should grow Asian strains of our tree species as they are immune to Asian tree fungi and diseases. I think, I think Ed, this is probably one for you. Yeah, and again, the advantage of a botanic collection is you can kind of do this interesting compare and contrast question. So the species like Fraxinus ornus, for example, appears to be pretty robust against the threat of, um, of ash dieback. Um, you know, ash is a weird tree. It supports 900 species. It's got a really distinctive niche. So my, 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 my aim always is can we replace ash with ash? And there's still so much to work to do on mining the genome and finding resistance. So, you know, that has to be our primary endeavor. But I think starting to look at how some of these other species could fill those niches, it's, it's, it's a parallel study, essentially. And, and they could fill the niches without overtaking the niches. I mean, is it? Yeah, I mean, if you look at, say, you know, some of these Asian species, they are broadly similar, you know, that they have the kind of uh, the sort of craggy bark. They have the pinnate foliage, which kind of allows diffused light to come through. Um, yeah, they, they, they can do some of it. But I, I, I think, you know, ash, our species of ash has like a really distinctive pH, for example. There, there are so many distinctive features that, you know, I, ideally, that's our first kind of line of inquiry, I think. Um, from Tamar Durrell Fosfelt, great name. After reading The Brothers Gardeners by Andrea Wolf, I was amazed to realise how previous empires then changed their native country's characters with the huge import of trees. Many trees considered local today don't belong there, as we've been talking about. But her question really is, are scientists looking at the impacts that new trees have on insects and the soil? And Suzanne, we haven't actually mentioned the soil, but I was very struck in the slide that you used in your lecture about, you know, there's the, the CO2 that the tree takes in above ground, but the below ground is a whole world. Yeah, so, um... I think on average around the world that about two thirds of, of energy from a tree ends up in the soil. So we think of photosynthesis, where does that energy go or where do, where do those sugars go? Well, they go to building the tree, to metabolism of the tree, but on, on average, two thirds goes below ground across boreal temperate tropical forests. And the below ground community of fungi and bacteria, archaea, nematodes, the whole soil food web um, feeds off of that energy to drive the water cycle, the nutrient cycles, um, really that are biogeochemical cycles. And those organisms in the soil have co-evolved with those trees, right? The fungi, the, 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 the specific, you know, the specific genotypes of those fungi and bacteria have co-evolved with the trees. And so a, a cautionary note on the, the discussion about, you know, importing trees or replacing species you're also replacing or affecting yeah. the entire yeah. microbiome that's associated with those trees. Um, and, and so I think there's a, there's a, a caution there that, that um, you know, if we, if we do, and so I'm gonna take this little, a little bit further mm -hmm. on, on Kathy's comment and as, is, is, is that, you know, as we're, as we become, as trees become more maladapted to the current climate, as climate velocity mm -hmm. is changing, much more rapidly than trees can migrate. Yeah. And so we need to assist migration of trees and plants, um, but it's got to be done very carefully because of this co-evolution, this co-development co co of all the, the whole biome of, that's associated with the ecosystem. Um, and, and, and it needs to be monitored and then followed 
to so that we can learn from our mistakes. So anything I, I think that be cautious of wholesale replacement of ecosystems and communities and species, um, certainly where I come from, it's being sort of undertaken in a very gradual way. And I think that's smart. Yeah. And Kathy, you I mean you do a lot of work on, on soils. So how would you yeah. view that sense that you can displace or suddenly bring yeah. in something else and think it will be fine here yeah i mean i think you're right you're totally right suzanne i mean i think for me i mean so this is the difference between plantations and uh sort of so I, i've been recently i went up to scotland to look at um some areas where they'd reduce the grazing density of sheep and 10 years on in those river valleys it's just full of native broadleaf now they're all small plants, but they have naturally regenerated. So therefore, for whatever reason, they've got the right mycorrhizal assemblages in the soil. Maybe they're they're still there, and even after all this grazing, you know, that the, these things have come back. But then I went to a nearby plantation, which was like a desert. Yeah. I mean, it was just citrus spruce planted so close together. And there's, you know, the rivers are really acidic. There's, there's draining all the water. So I, I couldn't, I mean, I totally agree. It has to be done gradually. And it's also, it, this is where I think Ed's point about botanic gardens are so good for this, because you can see, is that tree 50 years on working in this climate? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has it developed these sort of these assemblages below ground that are so critical? And I've seen many projects where people have said, right, we're going to plant trees, go and plant the trees. They don't survive. Why are they not surviving? Because they've, they've not got the right micro, mycorrhizal assemblages in the soil. So I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I totally agree on, on that. <laughs> There's not much more I could say. But trees have been used so much by big companies in the last few years as, as we'll plant trees to avoid our CO2 bill, the green wash. Yeah. How much, um, I don't know who wants to answer this, but how much good stuff has that done and how much not so good stuff has that done? Can I quickly respond? I, I personally feel despair every time a, good, a company says that they'll plant a tree on my behalf. Oh. The first thing is like, where are you planting that tree? Are you definitely going to make that ecosystem better? Oh. Um, are you just going to plant the tree? Or are you going to establish the tree? Are you going to go back in a year, five years, 10 years and actually show that this thing is fully functioning? I mean, some people say it's 30 years before a tree is genuinely giving something back and fully functioning within its environment. So I'm, I'm afraid it's become such a lazy phrase and I think the first thing we have to do is challenge it that's not to say that all tree planting is bad um, the other thing I just want to point out is last summer I drove from Newcastle uh, back down home to Sussex and drove past thousands and thousands of dead trees along motorway verges you know we had that terrible drought mm -hmm. how many how many people have followed up on those tree plantings and, and you know, what's the audit trail in terms of perhaps mm -hmm. the offsetting that those trees Mm. we're involved in it's we need to be so, I mean, your point is that the trees were built by the government when they put the motorways up as one of the ways of offsetting on the motorway and they're now dead it's a very good point yeah i mean suzanne can you um can you follow on from from that point in in Definitely. the sense of you know yeah so if we think of you know climate change and carbon is one of the it's, it's we've got too much in the atmosphere we pull it out of the earth and put it up in the atmosphere and it's causing the greenhouse effect, um, warming. And when I, we look at how, for example, logging of primary forests, so old forests, what happens to the carbon when you do that? And what we found is like basically two thirds of it is, is, is gone. <laughs> so the, so the, you know, within, within a very short period mm -hmm. of time. So you, you log the above ground part, you turn it into pulp and paper and maybe into, you know, houses, which lasts on average only 25 years when we look at the whole cycle of things. Mm -hmm. So most of it, like within a very short period of time is the above ground part is gone. And then below ground, the logging impacts, what we're finding is that we're losing 60% of the carbon from the forest floor, which is the organic part on top of the mineral soil just due to the mechanization of logging. Wow. And so, and you can't get that back, right? I mean, it, it took thousands of years to build that organic material. And so in the time frame that we have to work to solve the climate problem or to avoid a one and a half degree increase, which we're rapidly heading towards, which they say is like within the next 10 years, these losses are irreplaceable. And so we really need to save these old forests and not greenwash with tree planting in, as an excuse to log these old forests. And, and unfortunately, that's sort of 
kind of happening. And I think people need to be really awake to the fact that you cannot, you cannot treat your plant, we cannot tree plant our way out of continuing to log uh, primary forests. It just doesn't add up. It takes at least 30 years to get back to carbon neutrality and then the lifetime of that forest to get to where it was the sink strength that it once was. So the, the projects that we have, this government has, of planting X millions of years, Joe, I mean, do you see that that becomes in any way useful or will we end up just... Someone said to me when I was researching, it's the trees we're planting today aren't the ones that save us from the climate crisis, which is sort of what Suzanne's been saying. You know, we've got to think, I mean, yes, you, we, we still need to plant trees, but it's about forest degradation and, and we're not looking after our forests. We're allowing carbon to escape and make the problem worse when actually if we looked after them, these forests could be, you know, very much on our side and 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 taking in some of the carbon we need to sequester. Um, but we have some very strange carbon targets with governments and nobody quite knows how to make everything add up. And the UK is looking for removals that would sort of give us negative emissions and they you know got half an eye on trees doing that for us because if we burn trees and then we capture the carbon does that help the carbon accounting does that help us get to where we need to go you know these are kind of these are sort of worrying times and i think maybe to i don't know if you're coming to it, but to pick up on one of the questions you, you know that someone's rightly hit on in the uh, q a about construction look mm -hmm. wood and suzanne mentioned this as well wood is a really good building material and yes it can displace very greenhouse gas intensive uh, materials like glass and, and and concrete and everything else um so it, it all keeps coming back to the same question. It's all about land use. It's all about human priorities. It's all about understanding the growing knowledge that Suzanne and Kathy and others are putting out there because, you know, for so long, we've only looked at these as trees for fuel and for timber. And now we have to look at them in a complex, you know, way with carbon, but also biodiversity gets so easily forgotten. And and we've got to decide what we want where. And it's no good planting trees, but cutting down things we can't replace that are non-renewable like primary forests. So we do need wood and we do need to use it in our construction, but we've also got to decide how much of it and where it's planted. So, um, the, Kathy, the question here from Andrew Heald saying, we are growing, did you say, Sitka spruce in Scotland as a crop of timber, not as a replacement for native woodland. Good idea, bad idea? I, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one. It, when it's grown as a crop, um, and the, the, some of the citrus I saw was a third generation, and it was a really important part of the budget for the for the for the, the whole um, estate. And that this we, would be used for building it's houses. The timber. And it's for okay, timber. Fine. And I, I I think as long as it's in the right place and is not leaching the soil and not replacing one forest with another type, then that, as far as I I can see, as a crop is of course it's it's a crop. It's no different to us growing wheat or corn or something. So we mustn't get so hung up on trees. But the problem with the citrus spruce when it's planted in the wrong place is it starts to have a detrimental effect on many other aspects of biodiversity. And that's when the problems come in. And that's the problem. I mean, I've seen eucalyptus in particular being grown above the tree line on Paramo grassland in Brazil. So it's draining the, the it's water, absolutely draining the water. It's an invasive species. It's you know, it's all wrong, wrong, wrong to try and deal with carbon drawdown. So when you're paying your money to some company when you're doing a flight offset, Ed's point is absolutely right. What tree are you planting and where? But citrus boost as a crop, I, do, I mean, I, I agree. It's a timber crop. We all use the timber. Hmm. I, I have a comment that I yeah. could add to that. You know, Please. there was actually just an article article came out about in Australia, how, how the province or of Victoria has decided no more old growth logging. And they point out that there's, and the same thing in British Columbia, there's vast, you know, area of industrial plantations that need to be restored. And that means thinning them out and letting biodiversity come back. Yeah. And that can provide, you know, there's ample Thank wood you. in there to provide for what we need. And we don't be, need to be replanting or planting more Sitka spruce plantations to provide wood. There's, Plenty of these industrial plantations around the world to do that and, th and it needs to be analyzed properly but mm. i think that that's something i see where i live as well mm. Mm. but do you think ultimately we should live in a world where we don't use wood very much 
we use I, other we use other ways of producing product i think we 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 should use wood I mean, I think it's very, very good in, in buildings it, for all the reasons that have been given about, you know, uh, the other building materials being apart from stone, or natural stone, but then you've got huge problems there producing it. But also internally, all the biophilic design um, work shows that having wood inside buildings is really, really good for your health. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's some very important aspects we need to think about. It's a natural product we've used and used throughout throughout history. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll stop using it at, at our health peril, actually. Well, we're pretty much up to time. I mean, you are but all four of you completely amazing. I, I mean, I feel it's it, that it's extraordinary to be where we are in terms of kind of what we know about getting to the moon, but that we're just kind of tiptoeing yes. towards understanding what these things that we love and adore and write stories about and want to hug are actually doing for us. And so I feel it makes my spine tingle when I think about it. And also when you realize that thing that it has a life cycle. I read a, I read a chapter in a book which was called Trees in Panic the other day about what happened <laughs> to some chestnuts in Germany. And the drought came a couple of summers ago and they lost their leaves in August. And then it rained at the beginning of September and these chestnuts realized they didn't have enough sugar to get through the winter. So they tried to do another flowering and it wasn't sufficient. And it just makes your heart ache. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. a child that's lost its parents and we don't think that way. So I'm going to take David Mallows's question as a way of wrapping up and ask all of you, starting with Suzanne, what piece of advice do you give us to save our trees? Well, the first thing is to support any initiative that will save the primary forests that remain on the, in the world. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, we've got vast work ahead of us to restore the industrialized plantations, to restore their biodiversity and their carbon sink strength. And, you know, there really are op these industrial plantations are operating at maybe a quarter of what they could be. So they need our helping hands uh, to, to help to, to restore these places. Great. And um, Joe? Honesty, you know, um, be honest about what we're using. You, you know, biomass will have a role, but let's make sure it's genuine residues. It's genuine sawdust. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's also absolutely fine to grow trees as crops. But let's not pretend then that is any kind of replacement for uh, a primary forest or an ancient woodland. So we have to be very clear, very honest, and we have to stop greenwashing. Yeah. Ed. I'm going to take inspiration from Suzanne and say consider below ground and above ground together we live in an above ground world we can see trees we can't see fungi but they are the underpinning of all life thank you so much and Kathy final word to you well I think I mean I, I'm an optimist I think that actually many areas when you leave them alone do have the propensity to recover as rewilding is showing us in many places place of the world and I think we just have to take the pressure off areas and stop just always going to try and sort the problem out in a human way I think we need to let nature have its go as well thank you thank you all so much thank you Suzanne Ed yeah. Kathy and Joe and uh, please join us on the 21st and um, lots more five by 15s up there online but this has been one of the most wonderful uh, hours that I've spent in an incredibly long time. Thanks to all of you. So thank, thank you, you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good night.